That, that's me, your lighthearted host and expressionist. And this, this is my podcast, Love and Lies. All right, ladies and gentlemen, today we are talking to a dominatrix. And uh, you get to give yourself a nickname since we're not going to go by your real name since this is an anonymous interview. What are you going to pick? Um, Justine, what I went by. Oh, Justine. Oh, so Justine is your actual dom name? Yeah. That is very sexy, actually. Okay, so a dominatrix is a woman who takes the dominant role in BDSM, bondage, discipline, dominance, submission, sadism, masochism, activities. Dominatrix are known for inflicting physical pain on their submissive subjects, which are people. And they are also, um, there's also kinks and fetishes that are a part of sexual play. A kink is defined as a sexual activity that falls outside of sex that society traditionally considers acceptable. That can include everything from role playing to bondage to whips. A fetish is an attraction to an object, and this includes body parts. Everybody here has heard of feet. I like a foot fetish. So a fetish is a type of a kink. And I just wanted everybody to understand that because some people, you know, they just, they don't know. I've learned a lot by doing a lot of research on this. And I think I'm a pretty well-informed, mature woman. And I've definitely learned a lot for sure. So I just wanted to put that out there. And today we have a dominatrix. She goes by Justine, who performs acts like kinks and fetishes. And after doing the research, like I mentioned, I realized that I myself have kinks and fetishes that I actually play out. I just thought that this was like activity that, uh, that turned other people on. I don't know anybody's other sexual life unless I guess you're watching porn. I have to admit that there are actually um, fantasies that I have about kinks and fetishes that I thought that were... You know, they, it turns me on when I think of those things. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like for yourself? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've all got our own thing. I, I certainly have mine. I guess I choose to keep some things fantasy. Maybe I'm not as bold. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty bold, intimately, sexually. But even then, there's still some, you know, some things I just keep to, um, to fantasy and haven't actually acted out. So there was a, a, an article that I read, and it's by Women's Health, and it's the 27 sexual fetishes and kinks you've never heard about. And I just recommend everybody going and checking that article out. Um, that's where I learned a lot about this stuff, about these very, um, exactly what they said, things that you've never even heard about. And um, it, it was a rabbit hole, but it got me to um, learning a lot about my own sexual being and understanding others. And so tell me about you. Do you have personal kinks and fetishes yourself that you don't, we're not talking about your clients. We're talking about just you yourself. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of going to sound weird to most people, but I, I love mannequins. Um, I have several in my home and, uh, just something about the human form just really turns me on, whether it's, Male or female, I just think the body is beautiful and fantastic, and I just really enjoy looking at them. That is, um, that's probably one of my biggest ones. So, it, are you when you're like walking through the mall and you see mannequins? Are you checking them out? Are you like, does do you feel sexually aroused at that point? Are you starting to feel stimulated? Are you just appreciate their um, their figures, their beauty? A little bit of both, probably. Some, you know, some of the mannequins are, are not great, but I mean, the Nike ones, they're, they're stacked. They're super <laughs> muscular, and I, I like those ones. Nike oh, has Nike. the best mannequins. <laughs> that gives window shopping a whole new meaning. <laughs> <laughs> when did you first discover that mannequins were a thing for you? Oh, wow. I, I'm not even sure. I just, 
I've always loved the human form and the human body. And uh, many years ago, probably. Like, when was your first experience where you're looking at a mannequin and you're like, I'm good? Because you know what? There's this thing with like masturbating to um, statues and stuff. Like, this is a real thing. I've always appreciated just art in general and specifically statues. And then, you know, you start to notice mannequins and it's not exactly David, but they're everywhere. And um, I think I bought my first one probably like 12, 12 years ago. And now I have like five in my house. Okay. And then do you use those to get sexually aroused personally? Uh, I did try once, but um, nope, they're, they're too stiff. Okay. So, so you appreciate them and they're a part of the ambiance of your home and they create this energy and, and something that's sexually stimulating for you. Well, I had to admit the other day, uh, Ricky and I were driving and we were driving down the freeway and I got ahead of him somehow through traffic and I could see his hand on the steering wheel and you know he's a lot to look at um but all I could focus on was his hand the whole time I was driving I was just looking in the rearview mirror and I was getting turned on by looking at his hand gripping the steering wheel <laughs> and I was like I love hands. I totally get that. Okay. Hands are beautiful. They are. They're very, um, but I didn't realize, I didn't realize personally that hands were a fetish. I've heard of the feet and I don't know where this thing came from for me. And it's not like anybody's hands will do his hands just for some reason, almost seem like they were the hands that I was always looking for. Do you, do you know what that. I'm talking about? I do. I love that. So it's not like you just look at any th- anybody's hands and it turns. And I don't know if that's what it's like for feet either, but um, that's my experience with hands. Um, also, hairy chest. You know, there's these things. There's a lot of other things that go deeper for me. But those are a couple of things that that I have definitely recognized that when I see that, I am instantly like whatever I'm thinking about or doing just stops. And, and that's where my um, attention goes to. And I want to figure out what mine originate from. The whole thing about you being a dominatrix is consent. This is something that is a key word here. Both sides agree. And consent to discovering, practicing whatever it is that they're into. And this has nothing to do with somebody that doesn't 100% want to do what it is that they're experiencing with you. So why I'm saying this, because we're getting ready to talk about uh, a fetish called scat yeah <laughs> I, did not know, I did not know that that was um, what it was called and I learned that like I said I'm learning a lot and scat for the listeners is where uh, Justine actually yeah. poops on her clients because this is their fetish it's a poop fetish it's where you poop on people and that turns them on and that might actually be disgusting to everybody um or you might like what the hell why would that do anything for anybody but i figured it out justine i figured it out and uh, we'll go into that a lot later but um, psychologically you know i'm always trying to connect things and this has always got to go back yes it's it's sexual play but it always goes back to something so i figured out a route (laughs) for this for anybody that would judge it because I bet by the end of this interview, they're going to figure out they themselves has kinks and fetishes and they're going to be weird ones too. And it's going to relate to something for them. And so we don't want anybody to judge. This is, this is something where we're going to educate ourselves, feel good about ourselves, know ourselves better and be able to love ourselves more. Uh, There's actually a wood fetish I found out and I'm like, what the why would somebody what about wood but there's something to do with that um that why that would turn somebody on so what is super interesting to me is that you don't think you're interesting <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy I, I don't i just um i don't know i'm just me i'm i've, I've started you know to really accept who i am and in being able to accept who i am it's kind of a free freeing feeling and i just very much want that for others so this I just is, don't think 
all that interesting, but I mean, I'm glad somebody does. It is. And a lot of us do. And anybody who finds it interesting is definitely going to be listening. And, um, but I, well, that was my first impression of you. I was like, wow, she does not think that you're like, why do you want to interview me? <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to interview you. Of course, I want to interview you. Uh, so tell me a little about you. You are lesbian or bisexual? I'm lesbian. Okay. And then as a result of an accident, just to give people a background on you, you actually do not enjoy sex. Uh, I, I can't feel it. I have neurological damage and I just, I don't feel it. But I still enjoy it, just not in the way most people do. Um, is it, let me guess, is it because you're giving that you're enjoying because, the satisfaction of pleasing somebody else? Yeah, um, I definitely love pleasing other people. And um, being touched is great too, because it's like, I mean, it's like when you go to the dentist and they numb you and, you know, they're like drilling in your gums and you know the thing is happening, you just can't feel the thing. Mm-hmm the same thing with me being touched. Like I know what's happening. I just can't feel it. So it it still very much turns me on. And especially if it's somebody I, I really care about, there's, there's a whole different set of feelings that, that I, that's involved in. And I get something out of that. I get a lot out of that. Uh, so kisses and um, affection and attention and role playing turns you on. Can you orgasm? Mm, not really not not the way I used to be when I could feel things but it's I don't know if I would call it an orgasm it's it's definitely it's like a mental orgasm okay I I will I've been in times where I just like lay there and I just like you know you got that like post-orgasm shivers I can still have that feeling it's just not a physical one so you have a a a post-orgasm feeling where you, you feel like your body hits uh a a point and then you feel satisfied like you get the satisfaction of knowing that you experienced and that your body experience you just can't feel it like your body goes through it the body goes through it and it's it's a really neat experience that i really wish i could put it into words but it's like it's a whole body experience Mm. emotional it's it's Mm. everything it's probably uh you know so a lot of people take orgasms for granted so you're experiencing it in a way that um, body, mind, from head to toe. That's what it sounds exactly. like. Exactly. It's, it's really great. So you are also somebody who doesn't, uh, even though you are a dominatrix and, and do these things, you are somebody that doesn't even talk dirty in your own sexual life and relationships. I don't. It's just, it's not for me. Um, there's reasons to unpack as to why, but a whole different podcast. <laughs> and <laughs> and you don't belittle anybody in your intimate relationships. Absolutely not. Okay. And then you you claim that you're also a bad actress too, which I think that you have to be an actress to be a dominatrix. That's just what I thought going into this. But after getting to know you, I I, I see where you pull this from. But it, you consider yourself a bad actress. Like, oh yeah, I'm a terrible liar. I'm not. I'm not great at it. I can't. So when you're doing this, you're really into it. You're not just, you're doing it for somebody, but you're not doing it because you're walking in and just taking their money and being an actress. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm not. Cause for me, like, like you saying, like I, I enjoy giving pleasure. Right. I'm not sleeping with these people, but I am giving them a certain pleasure and I enjoy that. Well, when I, I uh, first knew that we would be interviewing. Uh, I was talking to somebody. I said, guess what? I'm, I'm going to be, you know, um, interviewing a dominatrix. And uh, she poops on people. She does this, you know, this fetish called scat. And she works in a strip club. This wasn't the stripper that I've interviewed. Anybody that listens to the episodes. This was somebody else who actually ran a strip club. And she was saying that there were, uh, she was like, oh, yeah, she was like, there is there's this man that actually um, will call ahead and tell the, one of the girls uh, what to eat. And she will shit in a bag. And he will come into the club. 
He will grab the bag. He will walk through the club. He will sit down at a table. He will have the bag right next to him and he will watch her perform on stage. <laughs> I, believe, I believe it. <laughs> I know, because when I shared that with you, your uh, first exposure to this was in a strip club too. You were a bartender. Mm-hmm. Okay, so tell him. me about that. Yeah. Um, I had heard rumors about this guy before, and, and of course, like, a few of the girls are pretty judgmental about it, and I'm like, I don't, I don't see the issue. Like, if you don't like it, you don't have to play with it. Like, and, and so they, they ended up talking to him about me and they're like, she'd totally do it. And so he started talking to me. And I was like, yeah, like, tell me, tell me what you're into. Like, so I got to know him. And this Aside was your first from, experience. This is what actually walked you into being a dominatrix. Uh, yeah, actually. Okay. My very first client. I went big right away. What? I went big right away. Yeah, you did. Went straight for the stat. <laughs> <laughs> right for the stat. Oh gosh. Okay. Um, and so was this the guy, some, we talked, there was something about somebody eating it. Yeah, he's, he's the one. Um, my only concern there was like for, for health reasons, but I'm like, this is, this is a thing that you want to do. I mean, I know that I'm, I guess I'm as clean as can be as far as that goes. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I like just I like making him feel not judged. And as a person, he's actually a really a really interesting guy. You know, somebody who actually is more of a dominatrix, I guess you would consider than yourself. Somebody who's like totally into this, um, or or maybe does it more. Or uh, I don't know. But you said there was a girlfriend that maybe you started doing this with, and there was something about a foot fetish. Yeah. So. We were dating for a while, and okay, she's yeah. a professional dominatrix. Because you don't consider does, yourself a professional, even though you, you get paid and you do this, you don't consider yourself a professional. Um, I guess not. I don't know. I don't know how to see myself. I just It's just a thing I do, and I do get paid for it, but um, it's not. I don't know. I, maybe because that's not like my, my main job. It's just something that I make some side cash from. I can make a few people happy and just everybody benefits. Okay. And so, um, you started doing, what was the foot fetish with her? But she had some clients that liked feet and that's kind of like how I started to get into it. And we had a, a few clients that we would, you know, do together and she would do the humiliation part because she's good at the acting. and I am not. And I have cute feet. And so I was just kind of part of it. And I'm like, okay, I like this. And so she would go over and belittle them and then you would stand there and they wanted you to do what with your feet? Uh, sometimes they would just buy me different shoes and they would want me to just walk around in them or, or like step on them or kick them. Okay. Um, with the, with the shoes? With the shoes, without the shoes. And Did a lot of foot massages. Okay. And would he be getting off while this was going on or trying to, or? Master uh, no, he wasn't at that time th- this client he wasn't allowed to touch himself like that was a that was a rule and I think uh part of what turned him on too is like having to hold himself back no matter how turned on he was okay and um so when these acts are going on do you, uh are they allowed to touch themselves in front of you that that's a is that a rule that they're not allowed to or you allow some or what's What's that about? With different different clients. I mean, I don't care, but um, you know, we everything is spoken about. The consent is paramount. Mm-hmm. Like, you want to touch yourself, that's fine. Like, but um, not touching me sexually. Like, my feet is about it. That's all you get. Oh, but they can touch themselves. They just can't really touch you. Maybe just your feet, if you agree to that beforehand. Yeah, yeah. It's all kind of like, on on each person is different. Like. There's some guys I feel completely safe around and some where I'm like, absolutely not. Like, I don't think you could, I would feel like I would be in danger. So I don't even want to take it to that level. Cause there's been a few where right. I was like, I should not be here. Right. Because they were just, you felt 
I just had a bad feeling about some of them. I didn't feel safe with some of them. And, and I'm like, all right, I got to go. Um, and so you just left? Uh, yeah, I finished the session, but I was like, I'm not going to go back not here again. again. This is, right. I don't, yeah. Okay, so this is where um, we get a little deeper because this, your heart has more to do with this than anything. Um, when I asked you about your sexual preference, it has a lot to do with really why you do this. Um, and this is where your parents, um, when they found out about you being a lesbian, tell us a little bit about that. So I was in middle school and um, I had a girlfriend at the time. And by girlfriend, I mean, we like held hands and kissed because, you know, you're in middle school, whatever that means, having a, a, a relationship mm-hmm. with Betty. Mm-hmm. But um, where I grew up, it, you know, everyone was straight. I mean, of course, at the time we grew up too, like it was not cool to be gay. Like even in, you know, around the 2000s when like women would make out with each other in bars just to impress guys. Like you didn't even do that back then. Like that was like, no, not okay. And that's kind of how, how it was where I grew up. And, but I've never been the kind of person that cared what anyone thought. And, and uh, I liked this girl and we'd walk around like holding hands and, the school was concerned and so they called my parents and told them that I was gay without, without saying anything to me. So I didn't even know. Uh, so I came home from school that day and I was completely blindsided. My parents were, they're very Catholic and, um, they did not react well. They're sitting on the floor crying, like on the floor in the bathroom crying. And I'm like, I thought someone had died. Right. Um, and, you know, I asked them what's wrong and they told me what the school said and asked me if it was true. And yeah, and I'm not a bad liar. So I'm like, yeah, this is, this sure. is me. This is who I am. You didn't think any, I mean, did you feel that there was something wrong with you? Did you feel like you were different or were you just so innocent in your affection for another person that you didn't notice? It didn't matter to you. Like you, or did you know, like boys are supposed to be with girls and girls are supposed to be with boys. And that's just the way it is. Is that something? Yeah, I've heard that, head? you know, mm-hmm. boys and girls. Are, oh, that's the only way. But I didn't, but I knew, I knew that this was me. I've always known that this was me. And so I really didn't think there was really anything wrong with me. Like until that moment when I was like, Oh shit. Like just me is making my parents like cry on the floor. And uh, that was not a good feeling. I mean, we're great now. We've had a talk. My parents are wonderful, very accepting now. But it it took a, many years and a lot of work to get to that point. You're in the health field now, right? Um, yes, I'm studying for it. Okay. And so um, what are your concerns when um, you're performing SCAT? And people like w- wanting to eat it. Like, isn't that? I just, not I don't. Yeah, no, it's not healthy. There, there's a lot of bacteria, diseases. Like, our body's getting rid of it for a reason. So, mm-hmm. I don't think that's great. Like, I don't, I don't know how this man's immune system is. I don't know how how he processes it. I'm not a microbiologist. But I just, I feel like it's probably not great for him. Um, and conversely. If and you know, sometimes he would like for me to to poop directly into his mouth. Sometimes he like chokes a little bit, and I'm like, "Oh God, please do not start choking now, because like I will have to save your life." <laughs> and this is mouth to mouth because I will. I'm not going to let you die, but also this is going to be the worst day <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> I, I don't want to have to explain to paramedics. Also, I, you know what? Just Please don't die. Rule number one, don't die. So can you, can you please paint this for me? This, this picture, how you do this? Like, is he laying on a bed? Is he laying on the floor? What do you uh, have on? On the, on the floor. He's laying on the floor. And is there like a bag around you? Is this, or, or candles lit? Or what is going on? No, just actually basic. Just here's my bedroom. I the nice tile floors, easy cleanup, which is nice. Thank okay. God, no carpet. That would be awful. Um, and then I, yeah, I have like a cute skirt on and heels and I just 
squat right over his face. Let it happen. Okay. And so, um, so yeah, so I can picture that you have a skirt on, you've got heels, he's laying down straight and then, um, he eats it. Does he swallow it? He does. Wow. And then how much are you, um, how much are you eliminating out of your system? <laughs> all of it. All of it. All of it. And he's so eating it and swallowing it. Is he chewing yeah. it? Or is he just swallowing it? You know, honestly, I've never watched him do it because I right. I don't want to be judgmental uh-huh. and um and I don't gag easily, but I don't want I don't want to accidentally make a face. Right. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um and so I just kind of like look forward and I just let it happen. And then I, I know he like, he obviously can't eat all of it once. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so it takes him a minute. So like when I'm done, I've already been like, you know, money's on the counter. I've already got my money. So I just kind of clean up and leave him to, to do whatever else he does with it. I've never um, stuck around any longer than that. So you just do that and you leave and then whatever he does. Is, is he moaning when this is going on? Oh, yeah. He loves it. He loves it. Okay. Uh, here's a little, you know, psychology connected to this, um, just for the listeners, somebody, some people are like into pantyhose and this originates from maybe, um, being a child and sitting on your mother's lap, you know, back in the day, there's pantyhose, um, somebody who maybe had a babysitter completely innocently, the babysitter is, um, tickling the child with her feet or his feet. Um, and this gives both of these things give somebody the sense of, uh, safety and being comfortable, the feeling of Mm -hmm. security. So in your child and these things are happening, this is what, um, is connected to for a lot of people that have these fetishes for feet or um again like i mentioned pantyhose some people just see pants some you know they see that it totally turns them on and and that's where it can originate from you also have a client that you go and kick in the balls repeatedly for like 45 minutes yeah i've had i've had actually quite a few of those and tell me about that um you it starts off you know we'll we'll sit there and well, I massage my feet, and a lot of it is uh, like, like the sweat glands on the bottom of your feet. I don't know if there's just more pheromones that come out through there, but oh. we love to smell them, and that's a big thing. So uh, I would, like massage my feet and like smell them and kiss them, suck on my toes. Um, I actually like to have the heels of my feet bit a little bit, um, and then feels good. Yeah, so and we just kind of like start off there, and then eventually they decide that they're ready to be kicked, and so they either like to stand there and let me kick them, or they'll lay on the ground, and I'll either like stomp on them or just kick them, and not not too hard. I'm not like straight stalker kicking them, but just enough to to cause a little bit of pain. And, and then that's another learning process too, is deciding like everyone has like a different amount of force. The pain tolerance. Uh, and are they moaning while this is going on too? Yes. Are they touching themselves? Some of them. And, and you do this barefoot or in heels or the shoe on both. And they'll like bend over on all fours to have you do this or stand up. Um, some, some like to be on all fours. Some will actually lay on the ground with their legs spread. Some will be like standing. It just uh, depends on how much, like, what they can handle or how how much they want. Right. Some like to be kicked in the face. Some like to be kicked in the face. There's one I used to kick in the face, and he liked it. Well, okay. Um, and again, not not so hard that like I'm not trying to cause you're not damage. Leaving bruises, you're not leaving right and things like that. Um, you actually yourself like to be gagged and tied up. Uh, not gagged, uh, but I do. I do like to be bound. Okay, and this is um, where you feel a 
sense of security yourself. Yeah, I know it, it's going to sound weird, but you know, like when babies are crying, like infants, you swaddle them and they feel like they feel secure. They feel safe. And, um, I like that feeling. And I like that if the person I am with does that, I trust them enough to be able to do that to me. It's, it's a really nice feeling to be able to feel secure around another person and to be able to let go. Do the, does the act of being tied up? Because I know when we come into this world as babies, our first natural fear is of falling. So when you mentioned about swaddling, that's why we swaddle babies. So they have that security. You know, it gives them that comfort. Is that what the tying up does for you? Like you feel tight and, and secure like that? Yeah. This was eye opening for me because I realized that I do have kinks and fetishes and, and things that I do play out that I just thought was a part of normal sexuality, <laughs> to be honest. So, um, but when this happens for me, it's more of being dominated. And for you, it's more of, of, of a security. I think it can be both things. Like for me, yes, like uh, it's, I'm bound and I'm basically at the mercy of this other person. And, Yes, I'm being dominated by them. So this could be a very dangerous situation where like I might be I might be fucked. But I am also allowing you're myself saying not to literally, completely you're just saying like yeah. they could they could like no, leave not, you. yeah, not literally. Yeah, like I mean like I, I could be hurt. And um but and that and that could be a scary thing. But also being able to trust somebody enough to completely let go of that fear and let go of that your own control and just give that control to someone else is also a really interesting feeling. Um, it's a different kind of adrenaline maybe. Um, and then to be able to feel safe knowing that you can do that is also comforting. There's a lot of different emotions that go into it for me. I go out into the world all day long and I am, you know, making rules and being a boss and, doing all of these things when I come home I want to feel you know feminine I don't want to wear the pants it's quite the opposite and I um so this is where this kind of just makes me feel that much more I'm I'm in his strength does that make sense absolutely most most of my clients are you know, big tough military guys and you know lawyers and people that have, you know, CEOs, people that have positions of power and a lot of power and they have to have control in every aspect of their life. So when they're with me, they're finally able to relinquish that control, completely let it go and still know that they're going to be safe and, but, but to be able to let go for once. Right. And not be judged. And that really is the, the key here because people will judge this all day long but what makes somebody else feel accepted and secure doesn't work for somebody else when we originally talked I realized that I was like wow you know you operate from the same place your heart where people you want people to feel accepted uh you don't want that you know what it felt like to be rejected and and hurt for being naturally who you are. Um, mm-hmm. And so th- this is where your intentions come from is to help other people. Um, if just for a moment, feel accepted, like, let's talk, how much do you get paid to kick somebody in the balls for 45 minutes? I get 200 for the hour, but oftentimes, you know, I'll only be there for, you know, 15, 30 minutes, depends on how long they can handle it or will they get what they want out of it? I'm not usually there for a whole hour, but that's at least 200. Right. And then, uh, what about, and I don't even know if that's like the going rate. That's just, um, what sounded reasonable to me. Uh huh. The guy that, that you would poop in his mouth. This was that a bigger price. Yeah. That that's five. I don't, don't ask me what my scale is. I don't know why. These are just arbitrary numbers that just happened. (laughs) 
Um, and then he was wanting you to like schedule like yeah, 11 he, o'clock he in the want, morning or something like that. Which used to be fine for me when I was, when I was much younger, but now I, as I'm getting older, it's like, no, I have a time and it's, it's not, no, we're not waiting that long. I guess early. <laughs> and I, I, I can't just, you know, as you get older, it's, it it happens when it needs to happen. You don't uh, you don't really just get to choose. I've I've found right. that out at my age. <laughs> so I don't really. So meet you're up not with on a anymore. schedule. You're not on a schedule. Yeah, I can't just decide when it happens anymore. Right. And then what about? I had somebody for the longest time. I don't know where the hell he came through. I have a business. I came through, saw my feet, and he would just text message asking me if I, if he could, if I could send him pictures of my feet at the time, I just was like, why, why would he want to see, you know, I, I understood foot fetishes, but I was just like, I, I actually not too long ago had an Instagram, uh, an IG, uh, page for my feet, but it actually got taken down. So that sucked. There's a lot of money out there to be made for people getting pictures of their feet. Oh yeah. Like this is widespread. This is huge. It's a really common fetish. If anybody wants any pictures of my feet, I'm open for business now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you say, instead of really I'm calling yourself a dominatrix, that you provide a service for men to, to help them feel accepted for who they are, uh, that you really have a desire to help people feel safe and secure. So you don't necessarily consider yourself a dominatrix, even though I we guess all because, do. Yeah, it was just because, you know, my ex that was a dominatrix was, and it's fine if that's what you want to be belittled. Um, because I've had, I've had another man that used to like to go running with me and every so often we'd stop and then he'd want me to like spit on him, you know. Spit and on just, him where? And his face. Okay. We we would be like running through, you know, like a populated trail, and then he would just like get down on his knees, and I would just spit all over him, and then I would allow him to get up, and we'd continue our run. And other joggers uh, are just jogging by, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, because he liked the people seeing it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I guess maybe the reason I don't really think about myself in a dominatrix way is because when when people hear dominatrix, the first thing they think of is like whips and getting kicked around and being belittled, and that's not what I do. I've been asked to do it, but again, I'm not a good actress and that's not what I want to do. I want to make somebody feel good. It's it's more of like a positive thing. So I think I'm a bit different in that way. Just the life coach in me, when we've talked, I see a connection between your abandonment issues from when your school outed you uh, to your parents and that feeling that you had um, being connected with why you do this because you yourself didn't have that security and that comfort and, and your parents not judging you. Oh, there's a definite connection there. Um, I, it's, it doesn't feel great to not feel good about yourself and, and think that this part of who you are that you did not choose it just happens to be who you are um, is so unaccepted by people. And like, you're not, no one's getting hurt. You know, it, it just happens to be who you are. And it's a terrible feeling. And it's not something I wish for anybody. So if there's something that I can do to help people not feel that way, then that's, that's exactly what I want to do. And that's, that's who I want to be. Does it make you yourself feel like you're healing yourself? Like you're healing? This is, this is a bit of healing because how you felt as a child or as a young girl? Or do you I feel like selfishly, you healing? Selfishly, maybe a little bit. Um, I don't know if that, that pain is ever going to go away. Um, I, don't, I don't do well with dealing with my own shit. 
I like I like to keep it in a little box and just shove it deep down inside. And I'm like, okay, I'm I can't that can't be fixed for me, but maybe I can help somebody else. So so they don't get to this point, you know. When I was talking about um, wood turning people on. This just for everybody out there listening. This is how we we our minds connect things. When you are hitting puberty, let's just say a young boy doesn't have privacy, and he's starting. You know, his body's changing, and he's waking up with these you know feelings, and and his body's responding to it. Um, some people will had to have gone into like perhaps the woodshed and they would masturbate and relieve themselves. The connection to wood with masturbating and sex are, it's there. That's the connection. So because they experienced that multiple times and it was a part of them exploring later on in life when they're around wood it can sexually turn them on. And that's the same that goes for, this is where I kind of got down to a root um, for some people when it comes to scat is that maybe there's siblings, you know, maybe they just don't have privacy and they will go into the bathroom. Maybe they're, they're at school and they get aroused and they want to relieve themselves really quick or they don't know what to do. I mean, they're figuring things out and they go into the bathroom and the smell of a bathroom. If you do this multiple times, chances are there's going to be the smell of, of um, feces in the air. And this being some way that their mind connects and gets turned on by shit the sense of memory is a powerful thing isn't that mind-blowing oh yeah to think that the two are connected and and why people shouldn't judge because this is just something that one if it's not hurting you and it's consent between two adults that's their thing but um to know that it could go back to that to such moments when you're young, 10, 11, 12. I mean, and that's like really the time, like, you know, we're getting our hormones, we're figuring things out, like our neural pathways are being laid out at that time. And we may not understand how or why at the time, but it kind of emolts us and it, it just is. Your clients are high profile, high powered men. They are not men that are just submissive in life. And these are men that are out there with a lot of power and control. And they have a need to give up all of that or to feel completely submissive to somebody else that allows them to escape. How old were you when you were holding hands? Um, like eighth, eighth grade. Eighth grade. So 12, 12, 13, 12 13, there. yeah. And the sense of holding hands. So I wonder if that has to do with your hand thing, your hand fetish. It gave me the know. sense of security. I know I'm going to start doing research more on this stuff on my own stuff just to, <laughs> to learn about me because this is super interesting. You know, we just, I just thought this was the thing that, you know, but it's not. Everybody is completely different. And these are fetishes. And I would have never been like, oh, I have a fetish or two or three. But in interviewing you and doing the research on this stuff, I've learned I absolutely do have kinks and fetishes. These connections don't happen a lot where you connect with somebody that you can completely be yourself. Do you agree? Oh, your absolutely. Yeah. It's really hard to find somebody that that you can feel safe with that in that way, in a very deep way. Yeah, because you even said that your relationships, if I remember correctly, they would act like they were into this kind of stuff. Like you would say, hey, 
um, I'm into this or let's try this. And they would act like they were, but then they wouldn't be, or you would feel judged. Tell me a little bit more about that. Um, I've, I've definitely been judged for even just for being the, the dominatrix, you know, because I don't, I don't like to hide it from anybody I'm dating. I mean, it's obviously not the first thing that comes out in conversation, but if they come to your house and you've got five mannequins standing there, I would be like, what's (laughs) up? (laughs) Some people find the the mannequins off putting. I'm like, all right, well, are you kidding me? I would, if I walked in your house and I saw five mannequins, I would, are they dressed or are they naked? Um, well, let's see. (laughs) One of them, one of them is wearing my old back brace from when I broke my spine and, uh, and a pearl necklace. Another one just has, um, she's currently wearing my stethoscope okay. <laughs> and that's it. Um, the other two are just torsos that I've actually turned into like light, like this, I've been messing with my art and turn them into like light fixtures. Um, one's pregnant and I turned into like this whole mother earth thing. Oh my God, that is so um, cool. And then my favorite and she's the only one that has a name. <laughs> I was going to ask. Yeah, she's the only one that has a name. It was Claudette. And uh, she's, all that she's wearing right now is, um, my friend made me this, like, Ruth Bader Ginsburg descent collar. It's really pretty. So she's wearing the collar and um, this geometric, shiny pink uh, rabbit head. Kind wow, of like from, so uh, cool. you know, at the end of Squid Games, those mm-hmm. little masks that they're wearing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's wearing one of those. That's what I have her wearing right now. That's super dope. I've had a couple of mannequins, but I use them to throw my belts on and my necklaces and scarves and all my accessories and things like that. And I certainly appreciate them. Um, but that's really cool. And only one of them has a name. This is my favorite. <laughs> Your longest relationship was with the foot fetish guy. Um, yeah, I guess you could call that a relationship. I, I still, he's the only client I have now. Okay. Yeah. He, he's the only client I have currently. I know. I'm getting older. Life is happening. I mm-hmm. can't do this forever. Mm-hmm. Right. So going back to the relationship part, it is very hard for people to find somebody that they can be very vulnerable with and open and honest. I think, I mean, I'm a coach. I talk to a lot of people. They tell me a lot of things. There's a lot of people out there that feel like they want to be somebody else with their partner or be able to experience things that they just, they can't. They feel like they will be judged or um, left or laughed at or not understood. And once you say, hey, I want to try something like this, um, then somebody think that you're weird and then you've got to live with that throughout your relationship. But it is, it is, if you find yourself in that you're in a relationship with somebody that you can be completely open with and there is no judgment, I would say to the listeners out there, consider yourselves extremely blessed because this is rare. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. It's just not, acting stuff out it's bearing a piece of your your soul it's giving a piece of your soul it's not just it's not just to get off i'm sure there are unhealthy versions of this out there absolutely but that's not what we're talking about i created a piece of art years ago i redid it after my mother died it was one of my first pieces as the expressionist. I've not released this image yet and I will soon, but this was on love and sex addiction. And a part of the image is this woman who's got her hands behind her back, almost as if they're tied. And she's on a trophy case and she's very thin and she's got a baby doll head on her. And my reason for putting, I mean, everybody takes in art. So I really don't, I don't want to tell everybody, but I want people to just come to their own conclusions and, and um, look at the piece on their own because it's a message for everybody in their own individual self. But um, the head part was because of trauma. 
So when we are young and something happens, let's just say we skin our knee, we fall and we run to our parents and we go to them with our arms open and we're expecting this to be picked up and held and, and, and told and boo-boo's kissed and everything is going to be okay. When this doesn't happen, something just something like that can traumatize us the rest of our lives where we feel abandonment, rejection. We have feelings, we're turned away and we don't understand what's going through our body right now. Our emotions, we, we can't, we can't comprehend. We can't wrap our mind around it. It's too much for us. It can, it could be from a parent yelling at us. It could be something that they said when we were a child that we will never, ever, ever forget. And typically what happens when this trauma occurs when we are younger is we stop developing emotionally. And so when we get in fights and we're adults and we're out in the world and we're with our partner and we get in a fight, I resort to my eight-year-old self. He resorts to his 12-year-old self. And now you've got an eight-year-old and a 12-year-old dealing with adult issues, problems, whatever, whatever is going on from the emotional capacity of being a child, because we instantly go back to that because of the trauma, fear of abandonment, for example, being connected to what it is and this rejection. And it's, it's really huge. So a lot of people aren't likely to open up and really feel like they can be themselves or share their secrets or their desires because of this fear of rejection and abandonment. To me, I think we're all just a bunch of, you know, eight and 10 year olds, 12 year olds running around on this earth, <laughs> trying to just trying to find love, you know? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, really think about that. Our bodies grow up. We, we were forced to go out into the world and take on a lot. We're entitled to our parents accepting us and, and, um, nurturing us and raising us up, but we aren't given that. Even in your situation, like your parents are super supportive. They love you. They're great parents. You have a great relationship with your parents. I think you still talk to your mother every night before you go to bed, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, very right. But you still have this trauma that you carry from when you were young and the school outed you and you felt like you were dirty and you weren't like everybody else. And Your parents, you saw how much it hurt them. Yeah. I mean, they, for being you, they have their own traumas too, that maybe they were going back into that they, they weren't accepted. You know, when, when they got married, you know, it was very Romeo and Juliet. They spent their first night as a married couple hiding from their parents. And so like, it it just all keeps going back and back and back. It's like, if we can figure out a way to stop that cycle with, you know, with us in the future. Well, that's what we're doing right now because again, you know, they have their own trauma, but generations ago weren't talking about these things. You know what? There right. are podcasts out there for them to go, oh my God, I know I've caused my own children trauma. I absolutely have caused my own children trauma. And it's not on purpose. It's because I'm just like everybody else trying to figure out Life. I may be more in tuned and aware and um, choose to help others and educate myself and put myself in positions to do so. And everything is choices, right? But mm-hmm. that doesn't, like you're in the medical field, you help people, you do this, you're trying to help people. It all boils down to love. And the more that we can talk about things out in the open and not judge each other for it and just accept, hey, that's not for me. It may be for you ask how does that feel just being curious um and understand from a different point of view then um our guards go down and we have absolutely more love in the world and people that feel they can be themselves and celebrated um it's our job to love ourselves like i know our parents i get this every single person that i coach it always boils back back to the parents and even in your situation you know we are entitled to that, but nobody can love us the way that we love ourselves, can love ourselves. And um, 
And we need to get that through our head. We need to accept ourselves the way that we are so that we don't get into relationships where we don't belong, where we can't be ourselves. And we're doing it just for, I don't know, whatever other reason that the more confidence that we have, that we will pick and choose partners that will make a difference because this is sacred and it is about our soul. And I hope people get that from this interview. What was your intentions of trying to help? I mean, you hear you have somebody calling you up going, Hey, I want to interview because you're dominatrix. What was your intention Um, for this? Well, I mean, at first I was like, like you said, like, why me? I'm like, I'm not that interesting. But um, the more I listened to some of your podcasts, I, I saw your intentions. You know, you truly are also just trying to help people. You're helping the people that you're interviewing kind of work through their own stuff. And then the listeners, you're helping them because they're like, not, not feel so alone. Like they can relate to it. And, and I liked that. So um, I wanted to be a part of that. Which uh, Love and Lies episode did you listen to when you knew that I was reaching out? I'm just curious. I listened to the suicide one and I think it was like a sex worker Mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I listened to those two. Um, But the suicide one really spoke to me the most um, because, you know, because of all of that happened to me. I've gone through my like bouts of suicidal thoughts and I have, I've gotten real close before and it's really, it feels good to not feel alone. God, he would love to know that. What was your takeaway with that? Like, what was your moment where you, where it, it touched your heart the most? Um, or that you didn't feel alone? Or The thing that when, when I heard about how, like mm. stabbing himself in the chest, I was like, dude. And I know like this is like the worst reaction, but I was like, oh my God, like there's, there's so many easier, other ways. It's so much easier. Like, God, like that was like, of course, initial reaction. I was like, bro, like you, you could do this much. There's, there's more efficient ways because I'm stupid and that's my brain. But also I'm thinking he truly meant it. He was at that hopeless, dark place where the most painful, difficult way that I can probably think of was the way that he was going to do it. And he meant it. And that is a dark and terrible place and scary place to be. And, and I'm like, shit, like I've, I felt that. And, and it touched me and it really felt in a very dark way, good to not feel alone in, in the darkness right. and to know that it doesn't have to be. He, I asked him uh, because he was for the listeners that have not listened to that interview, somebody found him and his life was saved. And I asked him, I, I, I somebody else also uh, that I know are suicide survivors, but somebody came in and found them and their life was saved. Uh, They both said the same thing. They both said that they're glad it didn't happen. And they have such a greater appreciation for life. And I think that that's really important because a lot of people want the pain to stop. They don't want to not live. They just want the pain to stop. And um, that's a majority of of reasons why people want um, to commit suicide. He was so grateful that it actually didn't happen and is on fire for life. And the other one, oh, girl, the other one tried to commit suicide when she was 20, tall, blonde, beautiful, had everything, high profile marriage money, everything that is that you could, that you would think that would be glamorous. And she tried to commit suicide and was found and survived it. Years later, ends up getting cancer and has had this cancer reoccurring over and over. She's had something like 56 surgeries and her body bloated her hands her face her just she's so uncomfortable surgery after surgery after surgery after surgery I had to ask her I was like so knowing that you the rest of your life like 
you were going to be battling cancer, that you would go through 56 surgeries. Do you wish that the suicide would have gone through? She said, absolutely not. I am fighting for the very life I tried to take away. And I was like, what? Wow. Are you saying to me right now? Like, that is something for us to all learn. Like, nothing is worth leaving this. Or Like, we can always figure it out. But isn't that profound? Like, 56 surgeries and fighting for your life blood tooth and nail like clawing for it for the very life that you wanted to take away when you had everything right Uh unbelievable and of course I've got the sober episode that's coming up that I mentioned to you about that you felt connected to now what I want to mention about this is that the dominatrix would never listen to I asked if you saw the sober episode would that be one that you would click on and listen to and you were like no uh, no, I mean, I would, I mean, I'm in a different headspace now. I absolutely listen to that. You would? Well, knowing what Love and Lies is about, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but in the beginning, like, that would be something that put me like, ah, sobriety. Man, yeah, her, like, so- all right. Right. I mean, right. Yeah. So there's, there just, right, exactly. We've got the, the sugar baby and all the cereals cheater and all of that stuff. So her story, I briefed you on it and you guys have some things in common. And that's the reason why I do this. The stripper found God listening to the one about manifestation with Dr. Nick Castellano. And I know a lot of people, I know a lot of people are going to listen to this and they're going to look up some stuff. They're going to find out what their own kinks and fetishes are. They're going to un- be under more understanding when this conversation comes up about scat and anything else that comes up, probably more inqui- inquisitive and um, wanting to learn. I have certainly learned more about myself doing this interview with you. And I am so grateful for that. I truly am. And with every episode, I ask the same three questions. And so I'm going to ask you, um, where is the love in your story? Um, definitely in in the acceptance, um, like being able to accept yourself and to be able to feel accepted in the world and and to accept others. That's awesome. And where are the lies, or what are the lies in your story? Um. The lies that we tell ourselves and other people just in order to survive, you know, mm-hmm. um, it sucks. We shouldn't have to walk around wearing masks and costumes, but we do mm-hmm. just because they don't, you know, we don't think anyone's going to truly accept uh, us for who we are. And, and it forces us to not accept ourselves. Right. We reject ourselves. And it's just this cycle. And it's all lies, though. That's her point. It's all, it's all lies, yeah. <laughs> it's all fucking <laughs> like lies. You're lying to yourself exactly. so that you can lie to the rest of the world. But for what? Exactly. For acceptance. But when that happens, to that has to be your own acceptance of who you are. So you can walk in your fucking power. That's what it's all right. about. Majority of people's answers are that about the lies in their head that they believed. What did you just say that I was going to elaborate on? Oh, mask. So about the mask, the, Love and Lies was fashioned after Oscar Wilde's quote, if you give a man a mask, he'll tell you everything. So what I have done with this podcast, because I coach people, I'm like, if you only knew you're not alone and everybody feels alone, um, was with the anonymous interviews, give you a mask. Like, you don't, you're not gaining a follow. You're not gaining a like. There's no other reason for you to do this but to help others and also to free yourself. Uh, a lot of guests, you know, want to confess and get things out because it's a healing, it's healing to them. But you give a man a mask and he'll tell you everything. Like you've been nothing but open and honest with us completely. And we're so grateful for that. And now, finally, the best question what is the truth that's what i want for everybody you know just for everyone to be able to comfortably live their true self and to be truly happy with who they are if they can do that it's it spreads it's contagious 
Yeah, it is. Well, Justine, thank you so much. I truly appreciate your time and enlightening us and just making the world a better place today as this episode echoes for eternity. I just appreciate the love that you've put into this and your intentions and your energy and your kind heart. And that's it. Is there anything that you want to leave the listeners with? Um, just learn, you know, have an open mind about things. You know, everybody's everybody's got their own little path and things that they've gone through on that path. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for including me in this, you know, this community that you've built. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being part of it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you've got it. The Truth by Justine. Hey, 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 hey,